Hey, thanks for joining me today. I, I got a great show for you again. I have uh, Frank uh, Calabrese Jr. on. He was uh, associate of the uh, Chicago um, outfit, and uh, he's got a fascinating story, again, with, uh, you know, family issues with his father. He's going to tell you his life story now and tell us what happened, and um, I don't know, I, I think you're really going to enjoy this show, so I'll be right back, and I'll be back with Frank. Thank you. All right, I'm back here with Frank. Um, I'll tell you, he's got a great story. So I'm gonna go right to Frank. Frank, uh, you wanna introduce yourself to everybody? My name is uh, Frank Calabrese Jr. And I'm from Chicago. And I let, I followed my dad and my Uncle Nick into the life in the Chicago office. Yeah, and I, I, I was telling you early, Frank, I did uh, seven years with your Uncle Nick. The great yeah, guy. I mean, yeah, the great guy, you know. He shared a lot of stories with me, too. That's why I was so excited to get you on the show. You know, but... Uh, I was looking forward to that, too. Yeah, so I'll tell you, we, we, it's kind of the same between the both. I follow my father, and too, and some family members. So, you know, I'm just dying to hear your story. Okay. Well, great. Well, I'm ready to start. All right, let's tell these people. So I, um, you know, it's kind of born into this life, Bobby. Uh, yeah. On my Irish side, uh, my mother's side, uh, my grandfather fought against Al Capone. My uncle was one of the biggest uh, uh, union labor union bosses for over 30 years at Hanley with the Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union. Wow. On my dad's side, my dad and my uncle were both uh, made members of the Chicago mob. So that's why I would say I kind of followed them into the life. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, it was a little different than on the East Coast. There was a couple of differences. One, that you weren't supposed to bring your kids into this life. You were supposed to make a better life for them. Right. Um, uh, in Chicago, drugs was also a big no-no. They were very adamant for many years. All that, that although in the later years, that kind of changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up, I, I had a, a normal child, but most other kids in the neighborhoods, um, you know, my house was always full of people. I grew up in a three flat, a bunch of apartments, and it was all family members in there. You know, I, I went to school, I played sports, I uh, had a lot of great memories with my father and my family. He used to always say, don't bring the street in the home, it corrodes the family structure. Mm -hmm. In high school, my dad started giving me these little errands to do, you know, and, uh, you know, pass a few messages, do a uh, Go with my uncle a little bit to empty quarters out of peep shows and uh, do a little book work. Basically what he was doing, he was just teaching me a little bit about the street. So you learn a little bit about the street, you learn a little bit about uh, school, and you, you need both of them in life. Yeah, you and know. in high school, while I was doing this, I lettered into sports, football, and basketball. At the end, I won the Chicago Golden Gloves, undefeated as a heavyweight. And... Oh, um, you know, I wanted to go to college. I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, the problem was uh, my dad had this um, this controlled problem with all of us. He said, I want you guys in your beds every night so you go to the local community college. Kind of broke my heart. I wound up going, I, he wanted to get me a job with the city of Chicago Water and Sewer. And, um, you know, when he gave me these tasks to do, the problem was I just wanted to get them done right away so I go about my life. You know, um, it was very underground in our neighborhood, so we didn't know a lot of what our dads did, but mm. we had ideas yep. a little more when the guy from over came out. But anyways, um, he got me a job with the city of Chicago, working with the water and sewer in the day, and at night my dad said, you're my secret weapon, you're going to help me a little bit here. And the problem was the more I did, the better I was at it, the more I seen him in me and kept bringing me along. When I, and in my... Um, 
my early 20s, they're constantly testing you, constantly bringing you further along. And I would pass these tests. And then I eventually, I bought into what I was doing with my dad and my uncle, but I did buy into the mob. I bought into um, my father, my uncle, family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you buy into that, uh, they constantly testing you, constantly moving you up. So now I graduated to arson and extortion, planning and assisting in murders. And I figured this was going to be my legacy. I was going to live two lights, work with my dad and my uncle, and also have a full-time job. A lot of people didn't know what I was doing. You know, my dad told me all the great things that were going to happen with all of this. Yeah. And and so I just went into the life, and, um, and I followed my dad and my uncle. The one problem I had... Uh, getting into it is when you get on the street, there's a high, there's an addiction to the street. You know, you're always looking for that next hustle. Yeah. And in the 80s, powder cocaine was socially accepted. It was only supposed to be habit for me. It was a weekend party drug. I partied once in a while. But what caught my eye was a friend of mine that did party. I couldn't believe the money he was making on a very small scale. I did the same thing as him, mm -hmm. even though I knew it was a dead son in Chicago. He did it well. I hit it well used everything I learned from my dad and my uncle to run this little organization that I had. The problem was, you know, always don't get high in your own supply. I did that develop the drug head. Um, when I went to prison, I cleaned up and um, I've been cleaned since through a lot of volunteer work. Uh, Over the years, us. being with my dad, the hard part was I seen my dad, we as family members, seeing our dad start to change. You know, in this life, you have to have two personalities. Uh, yeah. One for the street, and one for, one the for home. Yeah. And, um, you know, we see more with my dad. At seeing him starting to get more paranoid, more controlling, more manipulative, and more violent with family members as we were growing in and we were adults. You know, even when we started families. And I've seen a lot on the streets starting to change, too. The government's getting stronger. Uh, the mob's getting a little more paranoid. It's getting a little violent again. And they had spent years to get away from the violence. Mm -hmm. It's starting to get violent. And, and a lot of it is starting to... Um, I'm starting to see a lot of stuff that my dad said. This this wasn't the way of what my dad said it was going to be. And my dad himself has changed. And it's bothering me. It's bothering my Uncle Dick. It's bothering my family. You know, it got to the point where he was, um, he was not the man we knew he was. Mm -hmm. And, and um, things were changing, and I didn't know if I wanted to do this anymore. Some events happened, and I'm trying to pull away from my dad, and my dad was not a, an easy guy to pull away from or say no to. And uh, so what I did was when my kids were born in 90 and 91, I kind of just tried to take off from my dad. I tried, I wanted to take my family and get out of town. I wanted to start a new life. I hadn't had enough of this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I figured, you know what, it's about my kids now. I'd rather move somewhere else, Arizona, uh, California, and work three jobs if I had to. I need my kids to have a chance at life. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> so I took off and I hid in an apartment for a while. And uh, he found me. He found me at that apartment, and um, so, long story short, I, um, my dad and me, my dad would control a lot of our money over the years. He owed me a nice chunk of money, and I knew I couldn't go ask him for him and tell him I'm leaving my family, so what I did was, I knew where he had hiding places. I went to grab my money. There was a duffel bag with close to eight hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. I went to grab my money, and uh, I decided to take it all. I said, "You know what? I'm going to." I, I, I had bought a couple of restaurants. I was going to make as much money as I can with this money over a period of time, then put it all back, and eventually sell everything and move out west with my with my family. You know, a couple of years went by, everything was going good, and uh, I got more stupid. You know, I, I, I fueled my drug business with this money, too, and I'm, I'm partying, and I said, you know what? He knows that money's gone by now. He ain't coming around. He ain't coming by the restaurants because he knows I earned it. It's my money, and instead of putting it back and taking off with my family, 
I kept the money, bought back in my neighborhood, bought a nice house. Mm-hmm. And that's when things really got bad. Um, one day he comes to my house, I hear the doorbell ring. And the kids are playing in the foyer. And I can hear my dad talking to him. A chill went through my body. Oh, what does he know about me and I? The money. But I can hear that it's this good dad. There's no way if he was mad that he could control his emotions and, and be in that kind of uh, frame of mind. Right. So I'm coming upstairs. He's talking to me. And he's really nice. And, you know, right there it hit me. I'm going to start getting that money back as quick as I could, as much as I could, because uh, this was a stupid move I made. And when I opened that screen door to let him in, he grabbed me by the wrist and pulled me out. And when I tried to pull away, he reached for his pocket. He says, I'll shoot you right here in front of your kids. And I look over his shoulder, standing outside is my brother, Kurt. He's got tears in his eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is bad. And I go out there, you took my money, I want my money. Dad, you owed me a lot, a lot of that money to him over the years. He says, yeah, I know. But because of what you did, it's all mine now. I've been following you, watching you. I know about your restaurants. I know about everything. You know about everything but the drugs. Yeah. And um, he says, I own you now. He says, I own your businesses. I own your wife. I own your kids. I own, I own you report to your home. You report to me three times a day. And I thought that was the end of my life. Mm-hmm. But I think this was a really bad time for me. And so what I did was I sold stuff. I started getting up as much money as back as I could, and I got them a lot back, a lot of it back, mm-hmm. mostly all of it. And, um, and all I'm hoping for is one day, you know, uh, um, one day that, that my dad's going to say, you know what, you're almost going to pay me. You're doing a good job. You know, everybody makes mistakes. That's all I was trying to do, unconditional love, you know, yep. and that I would even offer to pay him every month, you know, a check to give him some just to leave me alone so I can do my businesses and I don't have to leave with my family. That's all I was hoping for. You know, um, my brother used to, my brother Kurt used to own 50% of a play that ran in Chicago for 20 years. It still runs in New York and Vegas. It's called Tony and Tina's Wedding. And we had caught my dad trying to extort my brother through some other guys, his own son. And this is how yeah. my dad was changing. Yeah. So it is one day, one night I get to call. He's son, why don't you meet me for coffee? You know, it's about time. I'm like, oh, man, this day finally came. I go meet him. We're hugging it out. He goes, come on, we'll take my truck over for coffee. We're on our way for coffee. He goes, hey, you got your keys to the, to the garage over there on 75th? I just want to stop in there for a second. I says, yeah, Dad, I do. He says, all right. He goes, why don't you wait here? And I was in the middle of a funny story. He says, unless you want to finish that story. I said, yeah, Dad, I'll take a walk with you. We're walking last, and I get up to the garage. And um, I open the door. I go in, and all of a sudden I hear shuffling, and the door slams. I turn around. My dad's got me by the neck. He's got a gun in my face. and got this glassy-eyed look in his eye. He said, I'd rather have you dead than you. I'm sorry. He said, I'd rather have you dead than you disobey me. And I just looked at him. Oh, no. He set me up. I always thought I was too smart to be set up. Yeah. But they always say, you know, somebody close to you. That's right. He goes, you know, you're scary. You don't have no fear. Now I'm thinking, he's going to kill me, bury me somewhere. I'm trying to get my kids away from this. And... They're going to go in life, find out what happened to their dad. They've never seen him again. Is he alive? Did he take off on us? I got out of get it out of this garage. I am crying. I'm trying to hug him. I'm trying to stay close to him. I won't break eye contact with him. I'm using sugar with dad and your son. I love you. What are you doing? I've paid everything. I've done everything. My kids, this doesn't make sense. I don't know what I said or did, but he put that gun back on the shelf. And, um, uh, He's yelling at me a little bit about a couple of things, and one of them was because I was supposed to be at the restaurant, and he said that I had my mind alive for him. He was just mad because he knew I didn't want to be around him anymore. Right. We get out. We get back in the truck. He's taking me back to my vehicle. I've got tears coming down my face. I can't believe what happened. Every once in a while, I'm looking at him, and I can see he's getting mad that he didn't do it, and he would backhand me to the face. Hey everybody, why don't you come up to my uh, Bobby Luisi store on Esty. We got men's t-shirts in black and white. 
women's v-neck t-shirts in black and white, a shot cup, the Robert Luisi Ministry coffee mug, the Bobby Luisi Show coffee mug, and of course God's Plans Revealed, and coming out right now, and it'll be out in August, pre-order your book right now from Papa the Christian. I didn't even lift my hands, I just sat there. I knew I wasn't going to get killed there, but I needed to get away from them. Oh, and yeah. the crazy part about all this was that my dad always said, we'll never pull a gun on somebody and oh, not use it. That's we'll right. Back home. That's right, 100%. Yep. I went back and got that gun and carried it in my pocket every day. It was a 38 stun those five shot revolve. If he ever tries again, I'm going to use the gun he didn't use on me. So these were some crazy times in the early 90s. You know, now I'm walking, actually this was close to the mid 90s, 94, early 95, and I'm walking around with this gun. I can't trust my dad. The mob is getting more um, paranoid and more violent with each other. The government's getting stronger, more weapons, and we got this whole case hanging over our head. Mm -hmm. That a guy is in, 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 in a witness protection and we're just waiting any day you know there could be an indictment we're not sure what kind of case that we got right. and so that was my life at that point mm -hmm. not knowing what was next you know you, you know and then and then the powder cocaine I stopped selling it I would just do it yeah but it was my escape not, not that it was right but it was my escape from my life at that point yeah. knowing that at some point something's going to happen and I had enough of it. You know, it's getting to the end where I know I had enough of this, I had enough of this life, something's got to happen. And in 1995, we got convicted. Me, my dad, my uncle, my brother, Kirk, and about five other crew members were running a loan sharking operation from 78 to 92. The threats, intimidation, and extreme violence. The whole time I worked for my dad. Um, and, uh, you know, I looked at that as my house. This is my out. Prison is going to be my way out. I'm going to be able to get away from my father. He yeah. won't be able to control me. I can clean up, get my life in order, come home, and just be a family man. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt the same way when I got arrested in 99. You know, I was done with the life at that point. You know, you see all yeah. the treachery, everything. I have a similar story with my father, but it's about you. We'll talk about another time personally. But uh, I understand, yeah. Frank, what you went through. I really do. Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I always say, you know, and, and sometimes people say, oh, he acts like a victim. He did drugs. He took his, his dad's money. Um, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm telling you a story the way it is. It is that. But I'm not a victim and I never ever claimed to be. And that right. word has never come out of my mouth that I'm a victim. I bought into all this stuff. I did a lot of bad stuff. Look. When we got indicted, and I'm going to tell the story in, in, in a moment, but, you know, I looked at prison as a way to straighten my life up and, and, and pay for everything that I didn't get caught that I did in life. Yeah. You know, and, I understand um, that. You know, and, and so that's what I was looking at in prison. In fact, when we bonded out, you know, the funniest thing was when I – was arrested. You know, probably they always come at, at 5.30 in the morning. It was summertime. When, yeah. when just the break had gone. Okay, so there's no darkness. And the doorbell were coming. I mean, the they called me on the phone, and um, I hung up on him twice because I thought it was a joke. I thought my friends were playing a joke on me, but I'm sorry, I hung up on him once. Then the second time they called, I looked out the window, and I see them all out there with their best on their nuts and everything. Mm -hmm. Hey, Frank, you know, see, okay, great, I'll come down and open the door. I'll get my wife to get your suit. I don't want to scare them or anything like that. I'll just come on down, open the door, we'll talk about it then. I said, okay. So I went down and opened up the door from, but on the way downstairs, I'm thinking, what is this for? Is this for that old racketeering case, or has this got something to do with the drugs that I've been involved in? It's the drugs. I was going to kill me in prison on the street. My dad, I'm dead. So when I opened that door, my concern, letting them all in, very nice talking to me and all, and handcuffing me. And I said, what's this for? What's this for? And they said, oh, it, it, it's an old uh, RICO case. It was actually the last day of, of uh, statute of limitations. I was so relieved that it wasn't drugs. And at the same time, my wife turns the corner in her robe upstairs 
what's going on? Why are all these guys in the house? You know, she knew they were FBI agents. She's seen the guns in the bus. I go, oh, honey, it's okay. It's just the FBI here to arrest me for an old mob case. She's like, what? Couldn't say it. Oh, thank God they don't know about the drugs, but right. it was a relief. Yeah. You know, he had said, what should I do? I go, I don't know, call my dad. We got to call my uncle. We got to call my brother. We got him. I go, he wait for me to call you. I'll call you later once I'm all situated. Um, you know, so I was happy about that, but we got bonded out and, you know, we were getting together and, uh, the number first thing that really bothered me was we went to see a dear lawyer friend of my dad and we had, you know, we were so underground. We had not really been in any trouble for a long time. My dad was good at what he did. Most people on the streets just thought we gave out some money and did some booking. They had no idea unless you were in, in, in deeply involved. Did you have an idea of how deeply involved my dad and my uncle were? So the lawyer said, Frank, I don't know. I know you haven't been to federal court in a while, but I just want to tell you, um, I'll represent you, but it's going to cost you 250000 And this is what I'm going to do, Frank. I'm not going to take any other cases during that time. And that is a discounted price for you. My dad almost flipped when he heard 250000 We were standing outside, my uncle, my dad, me, and my brother. My uncle's dad's like, wow, that's a lot of money. I says, yeah, dad, but he's not taking other cases. He's going to focus on yours. You know, and my uncle Nick is like, you know, we got to do something at least to get the kids off. I said, at least Kurt, somebody should be out on the street. Kurt, my brother Kurt shouldn't even have been in the case. They hit yep. him with some BS charge. You know, he got out on a I bond. He's never been in trouble in his life. And my dad's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. And from that point on, everything kind of broke apart. You know, we could see it in my dad's eyes. Yeah. You know, now he's not, um, he's also not, uh, he's not taking care of everybody. They're legal stuff like he is supposed to as a boss of a crew. Right. And my uncle's but my uncle's giving some money out, and my dad gave a couple of dollars to a couple of guys, and I never got a penny from my dad. I had to go to withdraw my pension from the city to pay my lawyer fees. And you know, Bobby, federal lawyer fees are not cheap. No, they're not, my friend. I know. <laughs> Fifty, four hundred thousand. You know, and that's if you yeah, don't go to court. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at that point, I started avoiding my father again. I said, "He's he's, he's not." He's, he's for himself. Um, in an early, well, earlier part of this old case, they did a civil part first. And he sat down, me, my brother, and my grandmother, and we went through all this stuff about how we were going to sit in the deposition with, 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 with uh, uh, feds, and we were going to lie through our teeth. Me, my brother, and my grandmother lied through our teeth. It's my dad's turn, and he pleads the fifth. And we had said, Dad, why don't we plead the fifth? No, you guys lied. And I, and at this point, we're looking at him like he doesn't care about us. He only no. cares about himself. Yeah. And here was here was the filler. I'm avoiding him now, you know. And anytime I, I'm carrying this gun all the time, never stop carrying it. Anywhere I go, I always got my guard up. I always want to be ready. The gun fits right in my jean pocket. Nobody can even see it. Anyways, I find out I'm looking at ten to twelve years if we fight this and lose. My kids are five and six. I think, wow, that's a long time. My kids are going to be out. Uh, getting out of high school when I get out. I only got one prior for fighting. Um, my lawyer says, yeah, well, it's because of the RICO Act. It's because of racketeering, you know. And, yeah. and, uh, it enhances. There is yeah. something new they're doing. Was what the, uh, well, it's a plea agreement, not cooperating. So I says, how much did they offer me? She says, five years um, and $125,000 time. And I'm like, wow, you know, my five years is enough to straighten my life out. And my, and my kids will still be young, this mm -hmm. is what I'd like to do. But before I can do anything, i got to run it past my father. So I'm avoiding him, trying to build up the courage to get a hold of him or meet him somewhere. And one day, I'm sitting at a cafe in my neighborhood, and he pulls up real quick in my, his truck, my dad. He pulls up, I see him, I get a little scared. Instead of waiting for him to tell him what I want to do, I go to make my way out through the kitchen. I'm going to go out the back screen door of this this cafe. Well, I step up to the screen door, and who steps in front of the screen door? My dad. And we're face to face like this, a couple feet apart. And I slowly start reaching for my gun because I don't know what he was going to do. He came in fast, and he starts slowly reaching for his, but then he puts up his hand and he says, Son, I just want to talk to you. I promise you. Just family. I don't know what's going on. Please, let's talk. 
all right, today's the day to tell him I went out there and I told him what I wanted to do. He was mad at first. He thought it was cooperating. A lot of guys weren't doing this yet. Yep. And I said, no, man, it's not cooperating. I just got to plead guilty, which I don't belong as part of an organization. So it's not like I got to get up and say, yes, there's an organization and admit to it. Right. You know? Yeah. So I see his eyes open up. He goes, I got a great idea. I go, what? He goes, why don't you plead guilty for me? Say you did it all. I had no knowledge of it, so I don't have to go to prison. And I'll call it even on the, left, the rest of the money home, and I'll take care of your wife and kids the whole time you're gone. I looked at my dad, a real stand-up guy, killed I don't know, 18, 20 people. Yeah, I and I just looked at him, my son. I said, I can never do this to my son, but I'm going to do this for my dad. I'm going to do it because I'm even, no obligations. I'm going to be away from him. He's got to take care of my wife and kids or I can jam them up royally. And when I come home, I can get on with my life. So I said, okay. Well, we went to the lawyer office and he walks in the office and he says, he's all right. My son's got something to tell you guys. And they're just all sitting there looking. He goes, go ahead. Tell me fucking idiot. And I just stood there like, you know, like a robot said, uh, I did it all. My dad didn't know nothing about it. And I want to call the FBI and get to it so they can release my dad. And the lawyers were sitting there like this. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Like, we, we don't understand. Well, yeah. well, what's going on? He's like, call them so they can and they, they can come and pick up my son. Now we're across the street from the federal building. The lawyers are, so we get on with it. He did all this behind my back. They told him, Frank, you know that they're not going to let you go. Maybe you'll get a little less time. But they're not going to let you go, but you're yeah. going to get your son a hell of a lot more time. Mm -hmm. So he decided not to do it. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I'm on the street and I find out from a friend that's in prison, there's a drug program, 500 hours drug and alcohol program. You get 18 months off your sentence. If you yeah, get it. yeah, I remember that program, yeah. Everybody is lying when they get in. So it has something on your record. It's not a problem. Call my pre sentencing probation officer. You know, because you got to report to her, her every week. You got to make phone calls. You got a P test. Right. And I called her and I said, I have a powder cocaine problem. She goes, Oh my God. She goes, Well, you hit it. Well, I says, I did. I wanted to complain. There's a program I want to get. I went over it with her. She goes, All right, come on in and pee. I pee. I pee dirty. She goes, I can't set up the court date any quicker, but seven weeks from now, you're going to go in front of the judge. You'll violate, you'll go in the system, and you'll get that program. Are you going to be okay till then? I says, yeah. I was happy. Yep. I'm looking at around five years, minus good time, minus the 18 months for the program, less than three years. This is going to work out perfect. Well, the government didn't like it. They said, I'm lying, that they've been following the Calabrises for years, and uh, they, they're not into drugs. And I told her, I said, but I pee dirty. She says, yeah, they're offering you a 30 to the outpatient, and... Uh, and then going, you can't have that program. I says, okay. I confided in somebody close to me that, that was with law enforcement. He says, this is what you do. You have to report to him every week. You have to call her. Stop doing it. After two to three weeks, when she can't find you, she's going to violate you. The marshals will come and arrest you. And um, they'll put you in prison, and you have to get that program by law. They have to give it to you. They can't deny you. Now you've got a lot of time right for going in. Yeah. So I said, okay, and that's what I did. I hid in plain sight. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the marshal to come. My fingers are in order. Bobby, um, real quick, all of a sudden I'm at a fest, a feast. I used to do fried calamari at the feast every year. I'm yeah. thinking the marshals are coming here. I'm on the fryer. My family's there. I feel a hand grab me. It's my dad. He's pissed. I got two guys on you. Come over here by that trailer. Go by the trailer, what's going on? You tell me, Miss Lowley called me, says she can't find you. Oh, no. I forgot it was his pre sentencing officer, too. And she liked me so much, instead of violating me like I wanted her to do, she called my dad and said she couldn't find me. And you know what he's thinking? I could cause a lot of problems for him. i got to change heart. So this is where we came clean with all this. And this is where we made promises to one another. And we were there all night. We went for coffee after that and, and to eat. And, you know, it came out of it like this. My dad, with tears in his eyes, said, Frankie, please promise me you'll never do drugs again. And I gave him my word, and I kept it to this day, and I'll always keep that word. Uh, God bless. Dad, promise me when I come home that you won't pull me back into this life, man. I says, I want to be a family man. He 
promised me that. I said, and another thing there, we need to work on our relationship, man. You trying to kill me. He goes, I know we're gonna work on it. We parted and we went. I went to court, I violated, and I wound up in Metropolitan Correctional Center, which is a maximum security holding center. They got I know they got them on the East Coast too. Oh, I was on them, yeah. All the way from the federal court. Mm -hmm. And everybody pled guilty. My dad got 12, my uncle got seven, I got five, my brother got two, and uh, all the other guys pled guilty but one guy. You know, I think they offered him like three or four years and he fought it and lost and got a 10 year sentence. Yeah. So me and him are in this, in this facility and everybody else eventually gets to report to their different prisons because they were out on top. The day I woke up in jail, I felt good. I felt really, really good. In fact, my mother and my youngest brother came a week later to see me. And they're looking at me weird. And I'm thinking it's something with my kids, something's going on. Please tell me. You got to tell me. My mom starts laughing. She's Frankie. We're looking at you weird because you look great. You've been in here a week. You look better in here than you did on the street. I thought this was a bad place. I go, Mom, I'm, fine. I'm finally getting this done. I'm finally starting it. I got that weight off of my shoulder. Don't come back no more. I'll call you. I'll see you when I get home. I'll be fine. Be home in three to five years. I hope you enjoyed part one of the show. Um, I, I think it's great. I'll be back with part two. Hello, everybody. Let's go up to the SD store. Here we can get God's Plan Revealed in my new book that's coming out in August from Copper to Christian. Pre-order now.